Welcome to the Light Up Your Business podcast, the show where we dive deep into the world of small businesses. I'm your host, Tammy Hirschberger, and each episode will bring you inspiring stories, expert insights, and practical tips to help your small business thrive. Whether you're an entrepreneur just starting out or a seasoned business owner, this podcast is your go-to source for success in the small business world. Let's get started. Hi, we want to welcome everyone back to Light Up Your Business Podcast. Today, I have three very special guests with me. I have my oldest brother, Nathan. I have his wife, Amelia, and I have my nephew, Michael. You guys want to say hi? Hello. Hello. How's it going? So today, you don't get to just listen to me, yeah, you get to listen to all these guys. And I'm excited because it's always fun to bring people on that have different experience. So my brother, do you want to tell me a tiny bit about yourself, like your age, kind of what you've done over your career? Well, I'm 49, been a technician, service technician my whole life for auto industry and got about 35 years experience in it. Okay. And can I ask you, what did you enjoy about those 35 years and what do you not enjoy? Uh, modern technology is the least desirable. Uh, the changes in the car industry has been kind of exciting to watch. but When you say modern technology, can you elaborate a little more? Like all the computer-controlled stuff, all the advancements in crash industry stuff. Uh, some of that stuff, you, like tire pressure monitoring, you don't really need. People can check their own air pressures. Don't need a computer to tell you that. What about, because I've heard you talk about the software, the, I don't know what it's called, the, the thing that like tells you what's wrong. That stuff gets more and more expensive, correct? And they're making you buy like subscriptions or something. Is that right? Yeah, the scan tool advancements come a long ways from the early ones. The basic ones used to just tell you basic technology. Now you're pro basically a computer programmer, too, in these cars. So it makes it a lot harder to do and more time consuming. And that's why shop rates are where they're at and all that. Which means that the people, me, bringing my car to the shop because I'm a moron, I don't know how to fix it, it costs more money, along with parts costing. I mean, inflation is through the roof for everything. So tell me in the, do you like the, the I don't even know, because like in your career, have you dealt with people a lot? Because obviously my audience doesn't know. So, or do you, have you always kind of been in the background or? Uh, I've dealt with the customers face to face. Some, in some shops, you, the technician talks to your, te to the customer other shops, they have a service advisors that do the talking, the, the technicians in the background. It, and it really depends on the shop you go to. The bigger shops, usually you'll have an advisor to, to talk to, and mm -hmm. the technicians are behind the scenes. Smaller independent shops, usually you might have a technician that you're actually talking to face-to-face -face that's actually doing the repairs to your vehicle. Mm -hmm. And do you, uh, specifically, do you have a specific, do you do like just engines? Do you do exhaust work? Like what, in your shop that you're at now, what, what do you focus on? I do everything bumper to bumper. Bumper to bumper. And I can tell you, being a sister, he is the best mechanic I've ever met. He's the best big brother you could ever ask for. So I'm super excited. We're going to continue on with my panel and then we'll keep coming back to more questions from Nate. Uh, Amelia, do you want to tell us about yourself? Uh, I am third. 39. Yeah. I thought 39. you were going to say 13. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just stopped for a second. Sorry. Um, I have primarily been in the restaurant industry, um, was a manager, had been a server, um, multiple different things there, cooking, uh, kind of everything. Um, I am kind of switching gears and going into the nursing side of things now. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions and I'll move and then we'll come back. So on the manager side, mm -hmm. Did you like that side of it, the people? Because I personally don't like dealing with people. I did for a long time. Um, it's kind of shifting gears and people feel a little more entitled, I feel like now, um, since the pandemic. Um, there are still some great workers out there. However, um, it's a little more difficult to get people to really want to be respectful and follow what they need to be doing. Like, I worked for a corporation, so... Um, following the standards is huge and people have expected that over the years. So now all of a sudden you have somebody that's like, Oh, I'm not going to do that. And then people are like, well, how come I didn't get that? But you know, I got it the last time I'm not getting it this time. What's going on? Yeah. I'm curious in the entitlement side. Uh, I mean, I've seen it a ton in my businesses in the window specifically, uh, my barnyard, not so much. They're good workers, but 
Do you think that's a generational thing or do you think just the COVID in general made people entitled or you think it's more younger people or? Um, I think, I, I can't really say because I've had it on both sides where, mm -hmm. you know, the older generation and I'm saying like more of retired type or close to retirement. I feel like they have like that certain expectation and that's how it's, it should be. And they, you know, they've worked really hard to get where they're at and that's what they want. But then I've seen it on the flip side where, you know, like the kids' generation, they're like, well, my mom and dad just gave it to me. So I expect it, you know, mm -hmm. so I've seen it both ways. Um, it just kind of depends on upbringings and kids, you know, yeah, different avenues and different expectations, I think. I want to definitely, I've made myself, I want to circle back to that because I'm curious how we get over that as managers, business owners with the entitlement. Speaking of titles, here's my nephew. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, will you tell us about yourself, Michael? Um, I'm 17. I currently work as a field service professional, um, which is landscaping. And then I also work as a um, dairy uh, stalker and checker at Hy-Vee Barlow Plaza. And I will say, I mean, as my nephew, and I'm not just saying that because you're my nephew, but I think your parents have raised you right. You seem to know how to work. You're not afraid to get out there and chop wood or fix your car. And he has a he has a hobby of fixing old cars, right? You want to redo them? And uh, yes, I've got um, three cars that I'm currently rebuilding slash like working on to get them back to uh, being able to drive on the road. Um, they're all classics from like the 60s and 50s okay that's very cool and you're in your junior year of high school you said right uh yes yes okay so i'm really curious because you're young yet so i want your perspective you're getting ready to not go to college you said right you're not interested uh yeah i'm not interested in what college. do you want to do with your life um at this current time i have not like fully decided um i just know i'm not going to college haven't decided if i want to do like a trades or just go right into a working field do you have a field in general that you're thinking um, not really, but, um, I'm sort of getting that more figured out mm -hmm. as I work on like coming summer. So tell me, what was all your first jobs? Seeing that we have this young guy here who's trying to tell you what he wants to do. My very first job was at the age of 13, uh, picking rocks in the cornfields, helping a farmer's helper. You really had to pick the rocks? Yes. Picked rocks and walk next to the tractor and throw them up onto the hay wagon and then bale hay. I remember you and Tim coming home in the summer, like your, because I think you would do it without shirts or whatever, because it was hot, and your chest would be like all red from the itchiness of it, and it's yep. a nasty job. The best promotion at that time was being becoming a tractor driver. Do you happen to remember what you got paid back then? Uh, back then it was five dollars an hour, and they bought us Dairy Queen for lunch. Man, you were making some money back then, Dairy Queen. Five bucks wouldn't even get you Dairy Queen probably today. What about you, Amelia? Um, my first job was a dishwasher at the local cafe in our hometown. So I I don't even know what I got paid at that you point. Don't remember? I think I want to say it was like maybe six bucks. Maybe. Yeah, that sounds probably accurate. Did you like it? I didn't mind it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't have to really do a whole lot. It's kept wash dishes. I mean, you wash them, you put them through the dishwasher and you put them away. So it really wasn't yeah. anything crazy. It wasn't strenuous. I mean, yeah, you'd have to let a pot soak here or there, but it really wasn't yeah. anything terrible. And what did you say your very first job was? Uh, my very first job was I was a barista. Um, at, at what place? A, a small um, local um place called java junction they're now closed but was it because of you that they closed uh yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> uh what did you like it um it was fun um it did get a little uh annoying at times because they didn't really have like a scheduling system set up and the they only like they had people there all the time that only did like one thing and then they wouldn't schedule anybody that would do multiple things within there um, company and so uh, some people were just like out of work and mm -hmm. can really get any hours 
So as a business owner, if you're listening here, you can start to pick apart little things that we're talking about like that, like being unorganized with your scheduling, not having the right people, and, and it frustrates your employees, and then you lose them, right? And this guy is a good worker here, so you lost a good one, Java Junction. You should be out of business. <laughs> so next, uh, let's talk about what's, I mean, at, we're in different stages, so I guess we'll start back to you because you're the youngest. So you, I know you don't really know what you want to do, but what is something that like, if you had all day and all the time in the world, what would you do in that day? Just briefly, like work on cars, chase girls, what would it be? Um, probably spend half my day working on cars and then the other half chasing girls. Okay, that's a good little even mix. I like that the girls came last. Uh, on the fixing cars part, because they say when you're looking at your future, you obviously have your whole life ahead of you. And as we all know, we've did different things. I mean, my first job, I was a pizza girl. I made pizza at Amico. And I couldn't, I was 15, I couldn't even touch the oven until I was 16. But I was like, I can't do it, I can't just not do it. So they said, just don't burn yourself and you'll be fine. So, I mean, I look at that to where I am today, owning businesses, I never thought that would happen. So they say, look at your, like, what you enjoy doing, what's your passions, because that'll help guide you in the steps you make. And then you do little jobs, especially being young, you can. And then you feel like, I don't like, I hated housekeeping, I'd never do that again. So I knew that's not my career path. And then you start to realize, do I like working with people? Do I like fixing stuff? So I would say, start looking at that stuff, right? Like you like to fix stuff. Maybe you're going to be a, what's those people on like in Vegas that like repair cars? Is there a show on TV about that? What do you call those people? They like redo them. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like restoration? Like, is yes, that what you're talking restoration. about? restoration. Thank you. Counting cars. Counting cars. Like, see, I mean, like you think about that, like there's a potential for that. So you're more not the mechanic side like Nate is, you more like the restoring them from nothing to something great. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So that's something to think about as you continue to grow. And just remember, as you go through your businesses and that places you work, figure out which, what do I like about this job and what I don't like, which is why I'm asking you guys. Um, what did you not like about the restaurant industry other than the people that were entitled? Amelia. I don't know. I mean, because I like to cook. Mm -hmm. So, like, I didn't mind that. I didn't mind. I mean. Was the hours know. all right? Because didn't you work nights mostly? No, I mean, when I, as a manager, I did varying shifts. Okay. Um, you know, so I'm kind of used to having different hours, different scheduling, that kind of stuff. I think um, maybe some of the inflexibility of things, you know, mm -hmm. as a as a corporation piece, you don't get to be cr creative and things like that. Whereas, you know, if it's your own business, you can kind of do whatever you wanted. Yep. Um, you know, where I worked for a really long time, um, you couldn't just change the menu for the day or something like that you know whereas like yeah it's kind of cool to go in and do that to some of the things but I like to l really get my hands dirty and like actually make the stuff so like yeah. the small town cafe that I worked in you know as my first job that was the funnest because we could make cinnamon rolls we could make caramel rolls we could do pot pies we could do you know and it didn't matter and the people would come in and they're like that sounds amazing. That's what I'll have for the day, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm sure for you, it made you feel like you had contributed because you come up with an idea. Yeah. 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 And so, um, you know, it, it just makes a difference. And just to see people have a smile on their face and they're just like, Oh, oh my gosh, that's so good. You know, mm -hmm. like you talk about going out and getting food, getting good food. You're like, Oh my gosh, that's great. And then you get bad food and you're like, Oh, that is terrible. And so like, and I paid good money for it and you paid good money for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, what about you, Nate? I want to ask you on something. So I know you don't currently own your own business. I know you've talked about it, and I always think you should do it because you'd be amazing. You basically ran a boat shop. I mean, I know you didn't do, like, the bookkeeping side, but if you could do your own business today, what would you do? Like, if the money was there. Everybody has lack of time and money. That's everybody. But It would probably be a power sports repair shop. That would be cool. Because everybody is into the four wheelers, quad, you know, the quads, dirt bikes, snowmobiles, mm -hmm. and they, they, the, the when they want them fixed, they don't care what it costs. They don't squabble about price. They just want it fixed. They want it fixed right and on time, so they can get back to enjoying their free time when they have it. So. That's actually a really good point. I didn't think about how they probably don't fight you on price because it's their it's extra extracurricular. It's like they're it's my toy and I just want to go play, right? Yeah, being in the repair industry as long as I have, I've done the same people that I've fixed their toys, I'll say, mm -hmm. and their vehicles. They scream and holler about spending ten dollars on their tow vehicle, but they don't care if they spend three thousand dollars on the toy. Yeah. 
what would you try to do different? I mean, all the years of experience you've worked with people, you've helped kind of manage people in that boat shop. What what would you do different than the employee? The because I know you've had good bosses. I mean, no, but what would you do different? Uh, fair pricing. Okay. Uh, be the best, the best price you can be in town, and best customer service. Yeah, I mean, you customer will... service is the hugest number one thing in any business. Is is having good customer service. Take care of your customers. Yeah. And pricing, you can. You can be the most expensive and have the best customer service and it'll still come back. That is an absolute fact. Uh, all my business have been so the top dollar. but Don't want to price yourself out of the market either by being so cheap that you get get the, the not so good stuff either. But. but sometimes being the higher end price, you can get rid of those whiny customers or like the ones that are just a pain in the A because they you want to get rid of them because you have people that are willing to have the disposable income yeah. to pay that and why not bring them on? We always say we'd rather do less work for more money, right? I'd rather build less sheds at a higher price than a bunch of sheds at a lower price because I'm just turning my wheels for the same money or less money. Yeah. So, okay, that's a good one. Any other things you would do differently as far as even just managing the people or I don't know? Uh, keep a fun environment. Keep your cost, your employees happy and you'll they'll stay with you for a long time it's when you make it their job miserable or you're miserable at your job that you don't want to stay at at that particular moment in time you figure you'll go somewhere else so you can be happier because everybody's looking for good quality techs and yeah and it's a very shortage industry that people are not coming into because it it's they just don't want to get their hands dirty because they feel entitled they don't have to especially with the computer age and what colleges are telling students nowadays that they can make this money and not have to work, really. Yes. Um, I'd be curious, what kind of education goes into what, you're, what you've done? I mean, you've, well, you basically started with just natural knowledge, but you've had some training, right? Yeah, they do take, you can get the two-year vocational school, they can get your ASE certifications, and then you can get into a, like any of your major dealerships, Ford, Toyota, Volkswagen. They all have training centers that you can they'll send you to. And then you can become certified at the OEM levels, or you can go to independent shops and keep on with your ASCs and become master ASE. And you get that just comes with experience and test taking and does the certifications follow you or do they stay with that business when you leave it? They stay with you. You don't, okay. they don't go nowhere. And do they usually, does the company pay for that or do you have to pay for it seeing it follows you? Uh, it depends. It really depends on the companies. A lot of them provide that as a extra for you or they'll do a reimbursement program. So the, the, the your technician is not a good test taker mm -hmm. and he has to take it multiple times. It's not, they're not keep forking money out to get there, but he, you know, he's a really good tech. Yeah. Right. You get the, so there, it all depends on the company you work for. Mm -hmm. So you could start just general knowledge and then if your company really likes you, you do a good job, they'll invest in you. Yeah. One yeah. more question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. You can, if you got good mechanical abilities, a lot of places will prefer to start you out that way mm -hmm. and then they can, they'll invest in you and give you pay raises accordingly. If you get this certification level, they'll pay you more and so it it's works, well, works out for both sides. I'm curious for both of you because you're in business and, I mean, you've worked for people, but I have my own opinion because I ran it with the window business. But do you like, do you prefer hiring someone with a ton of experience that's obviously very high pay, but maybe extremely cocky and don't want to change their ways versus someone that you could, is very open to training and you can kind of mold them into what you want? I'd like to hear from both of you. Well, what I've found over the years being a service manager and it, at a, at a repair shop was the most time what I found with them, the, the guys that came in that said they had all this experience and knowledge typically did not work out very well because they were, they didn't really know what they thought they knew and they were not so humble about it. Where versus the guy that actually has the real knowledge, the good hands on, they're more humble about themselves. They don't brag about it but yet they're the best technicians out there. Mm -hmm. And what about you in the, the service industry you were in? As far as like a cook goes, you can tell who the good cooks are because they don't, again, they don't brag about it, but at the same time, they're like, I've worked here, here, or here. Um, and if you ask them like what their pay was, they'll tell you what their pay was. Um, and then you can ask them, you know, did you get a raise? And they'll be like, 
yes or no. And if they didn't really get a raise, you kind of have to take into consideration what the business was that they were at. But also at the same time, does that mean that they were not that great? Um, but then as far as the server side of everything, um, servers, I mean, there are some really great servers out there. And I feel like the ones that are really good are the ones that actually talk to you and actually are like, yes, I like people. Yeah. Whereas the ones that are like, oh, I've worked at Perkins for 20 years, you know, like, okay, can you tell me about it? Well, no, it's Perkins. Okay. That, that doesn't really help me, but I don't necessarily want you on my team because you don't really want to talk about it. You don't want to talk yeah. about yourself a little bit, you know, like good servers know when to talk about themselves, but also know when to stay quiet too. Mm -hmm. so. Sure. Are you learning something here, kid? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Tell me what you just learned from that. I'm hearing so much wisdom nuggets coming out of these two. Um, that when like most of the people that are like bragging about being really good at something are really just like not that great. And um, um, starting off with like someone that's um, that's younger or more open is better because then you can kind of like use them a little more. Yeah. So when you go to an interview, be confident, but not cocky. Right. Don't brag yourself up, but you can stand strong in what you know. And they're going to they're going to recognize that. Right. You could shoot yourself in the foot if you're just like, I can do everything. And you really we know we can't. Right. So. Yeah. That's really good. So same thing on the window side and Barnyard's been a little different because we, we know these people. They're like family and friends for the most part. But in the window side, when I would hire people, uh, they would, oh, I can do this and I'll be here and I'll show up and I'm the best. And we actually liked hiring people who didn't know what the hell they were doing because these window, we had a guy come in, I won't say his name, but he's from Salt Lake. He's like, I'm the best window cleaner. I'm going to do the most amazing things. I'll innovate this company. So we're like, we'll try him. He came in and against the other business partner he was terrible and he wouldn't show up for work and he was always high and he kept losing his wallet and it was like dude we i would rather bring them in and teach them because they're more moldable and sometimes they're so set in their ways they will not move to your way of doing business i will say some of the people that have had some like serious tragedies in their lives mm. tend to be the ones that um and they'll be open in it and in an interview too um they're the ones that also tend to be a little more receiving of advice and things like that because they've had different things in their past um you know for the company i worked for many times we would get you know people that were addicted to something that would come in and they're like i'm trying to change my life i'm trying to get myself back on track like this is a good spot for me to start and um we would take that chance and it yeah. really helped them out you know because they had that second chance and some people are really not willing to do that you know i've worked yeah. with felons i've worked with different people yeah there's going to be a bad bunch every no matter what you do but at the same time a lot of times they're a little bit more receptive than that's than an not. excellent point yeah i didn't even think about that so thank you for bringing that up i do agree with you i think i mean I hope you never go through tough stuff, kid, but we all have, I mean, all of us and you lose people, bad stuff happens to you. Businesses fail. Things don't work. And I do think there's those people that are cocky and they're like, I'm just going to keep going. I'm so great. And they will never change. And that's not who you want your team. But like you said, the ones that are, they've learned their lessons. They want to keep improving themselves. They are, I think some of the best that you're going to get because they are looking for ways to improve. They, and they kind of want to mold themselves to be a better person. And that's part of being a leader, which I want to bring you guys in on as well. And Michael, you can pop in anytime you have a comment here. Leadership in business and in your roles that you've had. So what kind of leader do you think you were, Nate? And was there things you could have improved on? Or well, I, I typically tried to lead by example. Mm -hmm. um, if, there, if there was something that came in the door that I wouldn't do, I wouldn't expect my employees to do it either. Yeah. And... If they wanted to tackle it, we'd tackle it together. If they didn't know what they were doing or stuff like that, it's and it, it's just a that's the way I always was brought people I was around. That's the way it was. Just lead by you know if I wouldn't do it, you don't you shouldn't do it either. And yeah, that's the big thing right there. And kind of stepping back to that other about sure. employees. Um, sometimes you can't always judge a book by its cover. Is a really good one. Because they may have a checkered past, but they're they're more more than likely the them ones that are looking for that work are super appreciative of second chances and and most places are so judgmental about what they did in their back in the back mm -hmm. past life or past years that uh, they pass up the good ones that 
are sure. actually trying to change. Yeah, like Amelia said, you'll get a bad one here and there, but you'll get that even if they don't have a past. And so don't know. So as a business owner, managers, whatever, don't just rule them out because they do have a background or whatever. Yeah, I think that's where it takes you as the owner or even the HR, whoever's doing your interviews to dig into a little bit. And I think when you talk to them, you can tell do these people change? Are they really trying to change their life? And I've been surprised some of my best workers, even on the window side that I hired, they, you know, they had addictions and things, but they were very open. Like I had this addiction and I'm overcoming it, you know, and I need to change and I want to change. And I think you can tell that by talking to people. I mean, am I wrong on that at all? I mean, yeah. I'm sure someone could fool you, but you can really tell if someone wants to do better. Well, then you can also tell by their past how much, you know, by doing the background check or whatever, how long a time frame is yeah. in there and and how much more is leading up to it. or And if they talk about it, let you know ahead of time before you do the background and find it. Yeah. That makes that speaks high volumes of the, per, the character of the person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how much they've, like, I mean, and you can chime in in a million whenever you're ready. But I think when you look at people and what they've overcome in life, that I like... Not that I shoot for an underdog, but like I, I love the underdog story. Like the ones not when you fall, it doesn't matter how many times you fall, it's how many times you get up, right? Because we will all fall. And like you always have to be stay humble. And that's why I love this podcast because I get to bring different people in, I get to talk to different things. We all have a different life experience. And I love watching people overcome. So like it's okay you really screwed that up, but like let's get up and let's fix it and let's freaking make it great, right? Because that's what makes me excited as a business owner and and a coach and all that stuff. I love to watch people overcome. So do you have any more you'd like to add, Amelia? I actually forgot what my first question was that I asked, but that's okay. When you were talking about being a good leader. Um, oh, yes. You know, and to piggyback on what Nate is saying, yeah, you can't have the mentality that, oh, I'm not going to do that, but I'll make somebody else do it because you just, they're going to go, well, if you're not going to do it, why do I have to do it? You know, um, even before I became a manager, I was doing stuff that people didn't want to do. And that's kind of what got me into the management position was because I would do those things. And then people would be like, well, you don't do it. And I was like, that's because I don't have time to do it right now, but I will get to it. You know, like, you know, if I have to stay late to do something, then I'll stay late to do something. But, you know, it's kind of frustrating to be like, well, I need you to do this. Well, I'm not going to do that because that's gross. Okay. Well, then I guess I'll do it for you, but you can go home then because exactly. I'm not going to pay you to stand around and do nothing. Yeah. So, and I think that comes up to, um, I look at that like, I don't know. I mean, I haven't really experienced too much in the window business. I had it more, but they didn't like something I told them. And I was like, I will help you go out and clean that van this time, but I'm going to show you how I want that thing kept. And I pay you for a reason so I can keep innovating. I can keep like we had KPIs. And so layers were like, clean the vans, keep happy customers, get good reviews, whatever. And everybody had one. And one day this guy asked me, well, what is yours? And I said, well, do you get your paycheck on time? That's one of my KPIs. Are the lights still on? Do we still have nice vans to drive? Do we have customers calling us and so you can get a paycheck? I mean, that's my KPIs because if I'm failing at that, you're not getting your stuff. And so I think it's good to, you know, I'll chip in and help clean that van if I have a little time. But if you're just been goofing off all week, dude, you better do it or you're not going to have a job. Because I think it's about respect. And again, hopping in when your team needs the help. You know, if we have something, I see John hopping at the barnyard when he knows we're getting a little bit behind. But for the most part, we hire people to do that. And I will treat you very well for doing that. But I think that's a very good point you brought up. I think also being flexible, you know, mm -hmm. and understanding like, yes, if the same person is calling in like for the same thing all the time, like, yeah, you have documentation on it. You do those things and you pay attention to it, you know, and that's where you sit down and you have that conversation with them and say, Hey, you know what? You've been late this many times this week or the last three weeks or whatever. And a lot of times they'll be receptive to it. Um, you know, and then there's some that, you know, may call in once a year and like, my kids are throwing up. I can't come in today. Yeah. You know, like just being understanding of life things because things happen, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, you know, there's been times where all of a sudden I have to go and pick up the kids from school or something, you know, yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. You, you don't always have a backup plan like you should. I mean, it would be great if everybody had three, four five people to lean on, mm -hmm. but you know, we all have jobs. We all have other things going on in life. It's not just a, you know, not, uh, not always is the community, the village that you can, can count on. Yeah. And I think being willing to jump in, like you said, and that's where us, us as leaders and your team should be like, I can cover for Jimmy because it's kids sick or 
I mean, I have a worker right now that she's a single mom and she, her kid's sick and then school's out and she lost her daycare. So we cut her hours back to help her with that. And I think just being flexible, because if you have really good workers, you want to keep them. Right. And then if I have to chip in and do her job from it, I will do that because I know it's not going to last. I mean, she'll come back. How about you boss over here? What do you think about leadership? What are you looking for in leadership for the next job you have? Or even, I guess, as your teachers, do you have a leader as a teacher that you think is amazing and why? Um, I was going to say that one thing that also I believe would make a great leader is um, when they uh, like are helping a new person come in and they don't go, well, I have all this experience and I'm like, you shouldn't have to ask me and stuff like that. Like they'll like always incorporate everybody within the everything if they like need help who's your best boss you've had and why um i can't really like i i guess i gotta say my mom just because she does oh, help. I was say, uh-uh, like, you can't say me even though you work with <laughs> like me, you can't say me but it's true you are like the best boss that i've had just because all the other bosses i've had have all been like the same like they all like act the same with new people they'll like train you in but then they'll just expect you to know it as soon as you, like, just your first time doing it. They're expecting you to get it right away. But then um, something you do is you'll, like, like if you have, like, still need help, you'll just continue to help them until they get it, you know? Whereas some of my other bosses, they just, like, said, um, do you got it? And then if you didn't, they said, well, just do this again. And then they won't, like, try and create a different way to, help you get it they'll just keep saying keep doing this way this way and that's one of the things I think I've learned over the years is like not everybody learns the same way so like teaching somebody you know some people can teach out of a book and they're great teachers out of a book but then when it gets to the practical world and like hands-on stuff there's some people that can't do that and having the kids you know each one of them learns differently and each one of them does something different and so like you know Michael's a little bit more hands-on and then, you know, Elizabeth is more of a bookworm person. Mm-hmm. So she can get it out of a book and like be lickety split at it. Whereas it takes, you know, Michael just a second to be like, hey, this is hands on. Let's do this. And then he can figure it out pretty quick from there. So I have to say uh, that's an ex- man. I'm so glad to have you guys on here. <laughs> If you not just realize Amelia's a great leader, right? She she pays attention to like these people are struggling, not because they don't want to do it, because they don't fully grasp it. And so you just have to be the leader and turn it into like, what can these people do? So there's a saying, get people on the bus and get them in the right seats and then make sure you're teaching them in the way they learn. I'm very much, I have to do it. I don't know what it's called, but like I have to literally do it. I can't watch it. I don't know what you're doing. Let me have the, the mouse and I'll do it and I'll have it in a second, but I can't watch. It does not work. Um, I forgot my other question I was going to ask. Oh, the mom thing. So you guys are parents. I'm not a parent. You're obviously young. Thankfully, you're not a parent yet. Um, I think that's a great example of what you did because you realize your kids are different, right? And I'm just me and I'm used to me. And not that it's a selfish thing, but I mean, I forget that like people do learn differently and I have to remember that. So for people out there looking for workers, I mean, that's a good example. Parents, moms, they, they recognize that. They see that, right? And so it's something to remember to like really dig into your people and how do they learn? And then dig into their passions because sometimes you hire them for a position and then you realize, well, hmm, they're actually really good. They're cr- I have a worker who's very creative and she's my office worker, but I'm learning she really enjoys like social media, being creative, creating content. So in time, as I can, I'm going to start pushing her in that direction and then I'll replace her. Right now, we're small enough, I have to keep her kind of doing both. But if you can find what they're passionate about, like I was telling you earlier, then you can lead them into that in your, your position, especially as you grow your company. And then you can keep them, and they're going to really love what they do because they're going to excel at it, right? Do yeah. you have anything? Oh, go ahead. Same in, same in the auto industry and technician side. As a good leader, you help other techs learn. Uh, some some techs do it book by book, by the step by step by the service repair manual and others figure out a way to do it a little shorter, faster, but yet be very good at their job. But you, as a leader, you help them with that learning curve too, and mm-hmm. promote them in that push them that way and help them with it. And it'll become a better tech too. And they'll get, they'll make more money and, and everybody will be a lot happier at their career when they're not struggling because they're, yeah just trying to do it by the book way and they don't may not be that good at it that way that so that follows back on everybody learns differently 
And I'll say being appreciative because I've had bosses that have not appreciated anything. And then like I will flip around and I will appreciate people because you really need to, you know, I hate to say it. Love language is a huge thing. Yeah. And, you know, some people really are like very much have to have that affirmation and mm-hmm. like just being, you know, even just saying thank you at the end of the night, even though sometimes you're like busy and doing those kinds of things. But like actually being like, hey, you did great today. Or you know what? I'm really thankful that you were here tonight because we would have just gotten slammed otherwise or something, you know, yeah. like and just saying good night to people and like, acknowledging them is like huge. Yeah, you can't build a village on your own, right? Like none of my businesses would exist without John, all my workers. I couldn't do it. I would be a freaking crazy person. And I'm curious from the young side of it, you know, if you could design the most amazing boss in the world or if you could be a boss someday, what would you want that to look like at your age? Um, I'd say, um, like mom said, um, somebody that's appreciative, but then someone that will also like teach and then um, will like let you do what you do. And like, let you learn like what the best way for you to work is. Mm-hmm. I recently, I mean, I, I've hit all this stuff in different podcasts. So I'm glad we're talking about it. Cause it's not just me mumbling it. Like I'm hearing it from all these different people in different industries, but, uh, appreciation. And like, um, the female I have on, she works and she's a single mom. We were asking from a single mom's perspective, what do these workers want? Right. And what has gone wrong in your past jobs? And she was saying a lot of people today, it's not even all about money. Now I understand we all have to pay our bills, but they would rather have a company that appreciates them is flexible with them, lets them have a life outside of work, then it's not all about like $50 an hour, great, but I'm gonna be friggin' miserable. Or you could be like, you know, maybe only $40 an hour or whatever. And I have a company that I love working for. I appreciate them, they appreciate me. So always remember it's not about money all the time, right? Because we all, like you said, have lives outside of this. And yeah, we wanna build these companies, but that's not the end result at the end of the day, because you're gonna go home, you have kids to take care of, you have a husband to take care of. You are going to have a family someday. You still have your own dreams. And I try to invest in my people. I mean, I, I'm going to lose some people because they start their own business. I just lost one of my workers because I helped him start his business. But to me, it's about building their dreams because I'm going to treat them as well as I can while I have them in my grasp, you know. And then eventually they're like little birds that leave the nest because I want them to go live their lives and take care of their family. And I always talk about I want my workers so happy that they go home and they're so nice to their families. I don't want them going and drinking and being mean to their family because they had a crappy day. I want them to go home and love their families, love their wives, because then I feel like as a business owner, I did the right thing because I can kind of lead them into being like my family's first now. I'm going home and that's that's way more important than the job at nine o'clock at night. Any any comments on that? I, uh, I, I agree for 100 percent on the appreciation side. Mm-hmm. Um, from being an employee to and 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 management is is appreciation imp- appreciate your employees because they do a lot and uh, the other side of that is the flexibility is huge because like like Amelia said earlier life happens mm-hmm. and, and happens in a heart in a drop of a dime mm-hmm. and so if a company can be a little flexible with with their employees, it's a lot, makes the employee a lot happier too. And they want to come, they talk about to their friends and family that I got the best job in the world because they are flexible and they let me do this. And I don't have to be there from X amount of time to this time. And, and it's like a slave driving operation. Like you're a robot Yeah, because nobody's a robot. Yeah. Yeah. And and the more happier your employees are, the way more productivity they're going to be for you as a as an owner and a boss and it just makes everything run smoother it's like a well oil machine at that point when everybody's happy and having fun and yeah they they enjoy what they do and and they truly care about you yeah. like i've i've seen it on the opposite side in the window some of the people you could tell they want to check and they could care less what happens to you and then like in the business of the barnyard i mean we have people that you can truly care about you and they're excited to grow your business with you and then i'm excited to bring them up the ladder with me right um, I have some questions I want to kind of pop in here. And if you have something, go for it, Nate. Well, and this, uh, I've had, from being an employee over the years too, I've had bosses where they'll say, oh, hey, how's it going? They try to be your friend and then they'll stab you in the back 10 seconds later to yeah. save their own hide. So, yeah. Discernment is important. So, it does, you know, you can tell that they're not really your friend or want to be, they're just doing their job to keep their, the way they are. So, I mean, you got to be cautious of that too so okay 
Yeah, I agree with you. Any other feedback on that before I switch gears to some of these questions I wrote down? Yeah, no? Right. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to throw these out, you guys. Some of this will involve you because you're young, Michael. But um, how would you define success in your career and how has the, the definition of that evolved over time? So for you, Michael, I want you to think about what would you say is success to you at your age? If you were like, I want to be successful, what does that look like? And then we'll work our way up to Nate. Um, I'd have to say for the, like the landscaping would be like producing at a rate faster than, or equal to our, our, um, our ride on guys, which are basically just guys that get to use the machine operated, um, spreaders and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they get to move at a pace twice as fast as, uh, walking or, um, uh, speed walking speeds, mm -hmm. you know? So I'd say that's a successful like uh, uh, point to get to for landscaping. And then like for working at high V or a grocery store or something, just like making sure you get everything down, um, finding the best possible way to stock the shelves the best, like make sure all the product gets put out. And, so being efficient. Yep. Mm -hmm. Basically. Yep. And as far as if you were talking to your parents and they said to you, you know, Michael, when you're my age, which probably seems ancient to you. Um, what, what would you look like if you were a success? Would you say, I have a great job I love, I have a family I love? What, what does that look like to you at a kid your age? Um, so right now, I'd say probably having um, the cars that I want and having the people that I want to be with. Yeah. And what about a job? Do you want five days a week? Do you want four days a week? Do you want to live in your parents' basement forever? What do you want? Um, that's. I'd say I'd want a job that'll pay the bills, but then still will let me do what I want. Yeah. Um, and living in your basement, bare, yeah, your parents' basement ain't that bad. As Please don't say that. Out. We're going to delete that out. Okay. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> okay, my nephew really is a good kid, so we're going to pretend like he did not just say that. It is not good. You yeah. want to bring your girlfriend home to your parents every night? That's what they made windows. You're like, honey, let's go to the basement. It's time to make our next baby. And your dad's upstairs. That's weird. They make windows for a reason. You sneak them Oh, my God. <laughs> It'll be 40 sneaking on a woman. <laughs> Okay, now really, you're in the middle age group. You're more close to mine. What does oh that answer gosh. for you on your success of your career and what it looked like back when you were his age and now? Well, success, kind of like you were talking about before, you know, it's not always about the dollar. You know, it's, it's really when I got into the management piece and the way that I still do it today is how I make other people feel, you know, because it's not about, you know, I had a good paying job. I left my good paying job because it became too toxic and not where I wanted to be anymore. And so I took a lesser paying job due to that. Now, you know, in that regards, yeah, I had to take on a second job so that I could pay the bills and do those things and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But at the same time, it's how I make the people feel that are around me. Um, am I setting them up for success for the next day? You know, yeah. you know, I know that Sundays in the food industry are a huge day because it's a day of relaxation for almost everybody else, except those that are in the food industry. Yeah, so, true. so we get a little, you know, you get a little busy in that regards. And so like making sure that you have enough stuff to, and not going, Oh, well we're out of milk, you know, or something, you know what I mean? Like it just doesn't make sense. Um, but being able to, you know, make others happy and be able to like take care of my family and that kind of stuff. That's what I look at for success. Like I don't see like, CEOs, yeah, great. I'm totally all for you, but at the same time, I don't understand how you have million dollar paychecks or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it just doesn't make sense to me. And I'm very curious because we're obviously we're females, we're similar, but you have the mom aspect, and I, my, I mean, I don't want this to sound shallow, but my, because I have no children, so I don't get to right. invest in them. So my children become my workers and my businesses. And now, again, at the end of the day, my husband comes first. I'm slowly learning that because. <laughs> I love to work, <laughs> but I think it's interesting for the mom aspect, because do you remember back when you were 18 years old versus now, like how much that's changed for you when you became a mom, like what your outlook looked like? Well, yeah, because I wanted to be a doctor and I'm not a doctor. I remember that. So. Yeah. <laughs> Did that bum you out at all? Or was it just so overwhelmingly amazing, you know, raising this little turd over here? Um, you know, I just thought about, um, you know, my mom was a hardworking person and she was a nurse. And so like, my dad kind of was the rearing family person, but at the same time he wasn't, he kind of would like disappear at times and, you know, stuff like that. And, and it was just because he was a contractor and yeah. things like that. But, you know, it's kind of 
my mom was the sole income provider and like thinking about, man, I have to go to school for eight years for this. Do I yeah. really want to miss out on my kids' life? And all the debt you would like, have taken on. That too, you know, like, um, you know, I just put that part into perspective because I didn't want my kids to grow up in daycare per se, you know, and there's nothing against parents that need to put their kids in daycare and things like that. It's just, that was one of the things that I was like, you know, I don't really want my kids to do that. And then, you know, obviously when we had the twins, um, we weren't going to put them in three different daycares because yeah. that's what, you know, the rules are is only certain daycares and things like that. I was like, yeah, no, I was just a stay at home mom at that point, you know? So is there any part of you? And I don't mean this like, Oh my gosh, I should have dumped those kids off, but <laughs> Is there any part of you just selfishly that's like, well, oh, it would have been kind of cool if I could have figured that out? Um, I think if I would have just, I mean, done the four year college thing, yeah. it would have opened up a few more open doors. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, the company that I worked for and something that Nate kind of said was if the company's willing to keep you, they're willing to pay for you to do yeah. those extra classes and those things like that. You don't necessarily have to have a college degree in order to get into some of these companies. Like you can go and you can get into different programs and things like that that the company is willing to pay for and the company is willing to like help you out be better yeah you know as long as you're willing to do it you know it's fine and you know there are some companies out there that can't afford to do that you know i can't expect you to be like oh yeah you know because as a small business it's not always feasible yeah. to like be like yeah we're gonna send you to this class and yeah we'll pay for it you know but you know i know at one point nate was telling me about one of the things that he had done he, in the one son came up and he's like, well, you got to sign this contract saying that you're going to stay here for a year. And it's like, um, yeah. No, how do you guys feel about no? those contracts? I've heard that before at like Mayo Clinic, you have to sign a contract for two years to get some of their teaching. Do you agree? Any of you? Myself, I think those contracts are a joke. Mm -hmm. Um, because typically if the employee's really happy with the business and they're willing to send them to whatever, you shouldn't have to have a contract saying I'll stay here for this period. Yeah. Because they're going to stay anyway, typically, if they really like what they're doing and who they're working for um, versus, a, you know, obviously there's some people out there that will oh, get the schooling done, jump ship the first chance they get. And then they realize they look back and say, oh, the other company wasn't so bad. Yep. They wish they could go back and but they've already kind of burned a bridge there and is how they went about doing it. And I think it has a, t a place. You mm -hmm. know, like, um, my sister was a pharmacist or is a pharmacist and, um, she got offered to go to a pharmacy and be there for five years and they would pay for her entire school, oh, you know, wow. her entire education piece. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously she's already done the education piece and they were going to pay for it if she stayed with them for five years. However, in that instance, um, the company wouldn't allow her to do certain things that she needed to do in order to make it successful. And so that's why she left outside of the contract and they didn't pay for any of her schooling. So they're not even any of it while she worked for them. Right. So she, she worked for them for three years and she just, she mentally couldn't do it for the next two because yeah. she knew that thing, you know, as a pharmacist, you have to watch what you're doing. And she's like, I can't send this out. You know, you're doing it wrong. I can't mm -hmm. send this to that patient, you know, cause if they're good, if, you know, they're allergic to something, I can't give them that. Like, and if you give them that, then you're going to kill them. And then that comes back on me. Yeah. It's not on you. It's on me because I'm the one that actually talked to them and gave it to them. Like, and so they wouldn't allow them to like have disciplinary actions and things like that along those lines. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, understanding that type of a thing, you know, if you're going to have a contract, you got to have to be willing to listen to that person that's going to be there too and taking care of those things because obviously you're not going to be there yeah I have to when I started that question with them would you have said yes to a contract and would you change your mind now or do you always see it like it's not a good idea um I always like probably depending on what the contract entailed like how long it would be like if it was a year I'd say it'd be a maybe just because like depending on how like badly I'd want to try it out and mm -hmm. stuff like that but if it was like a super long contract, say five years, I probably would say no, even if it was something that I wanted to try out just because I wouldn't like actually want to, like, I don't know if I'd want to commit to five years. Does five years sound like a really long time to a guy your age? Uh, yes. Yeah. I think it, to me, it still does. Say, too. So, it still yeah. does to me too. I was so. just curious if a young guy thought so. Because like I, like if um, I've gone back and I've looked through what I've done within the year of 2023 and um it's so much that you can do in a year when you're like not strapped to something mm -hmm. and you get to kind of just do what you want. 
and um, like being committed to five years, that's giving up a whole bunch of option, yeah. options or opportunities that I could be doing. You have no idea where you're going to be in five years. I mean, I think in a year how much stuff changes. It's so crazy. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to another question. Uh, just real fast, remote work. Has anyone done that here? Because, you know, it's the rage. Everybody's working from home today. There's certain places, again, that you can do that and mm -hmm. certain things that you can't. So, Would any of you want to do it? I've thought about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, just when kids were little and stuff like that, I mean, it would be nice to be at home. But at the same time, it's like, I think I would get too distracted. Well, that's what I'm curious <laughs> with parents because I do know some people who do it and they're like, the kids are constantly freaking by. And that's why they buy a shed from me because they need an office outside the house. I have a guy I'm coaching right now. He's looking to do an art business and he can't work from home. The kids won't leave him alone. And that's so I said, we'll just use my office for an hour a week to get some of your stuff done because you can't get it done at home. I mean, in your business, you could kind of technically uh, well, it'd be a side job, I guess, huh? Um, work from home would be more like a mobile repair service. Yeah. So it'd be like an extension of the shop. Does that interest you? You could. It, it would actually be more and more companies are starting to do it more auto in the auto industry. They're starting to do mobile services. They're limiting what they do. Obviously, you're not don't have the same capabilities in the field as mm -hmm. you do in a shop. But it's it, it, but it is a little, they do charge a little more money for the that service. Mm -hmm. And some people like it because they can leave their car in the driveway and get it fixed right there. Yeah, they don't have to take the time out of their day to take it in and have it you know have an appointment set, and they can just make the phone call. The co the company brings the a van or whatever out repairs it right there and off they go i didn't realize they actually are starting to do that i use like a mobile detailer they come to my shop to detail the cars once a month and it's so convenient because i don't have to drop my car off i'm not without my car so that's kind of interesting business idea i didn't really think of that concept because you could charge for it and people are if you have the money you have the discretionary income for that you would pay for it yeah and they charge a little more for that service it's mm -hmm. and they send a technician out that's qualified for the job and mm -hmm. they can do it right there I just thought of a business I could create, Nate. Uh, <laughs> what about you? Would you want to work from home? Do you like the idea of that, or do you like to be around people too much? Um, so currently I want to work around people just because then I could still like gain the experience from them. And if I'm working from home, then I'm just only knowing what I know, and yeah. I can't like bounce ideas or learn from other people. I mean, obviously, I don't really offer that option now at my company, but I've done some research on it. And I do find and you're seeing it in the news. A lot of these big companies, Google, Microsoft, they're making everybody go back to work because you lose track of your people. They're not connecting the ideas. Like you said, you can't bounce ideas off each other, which is, I think, nice because sometimes I mean, I'm looking at all of us and I'm, I'm learning so much just from talking to you guys. And so I think it's super cool to have that option to have the creativity happening in front of us. I also want to talk about the college thing for a second because you were talking about education. And I thought to myself, you know, I went to school for a two year general secretary program. I have a diploma, basically, but it's not a degree. And yeah, I mean, I learned accounting and that stuff. So I would recommend it. It went to the technical college, but it was enough to propel me to start in the office industry. And then I kept doing that. And now I own multiple businesses. So you don't have to go to school for that stuff. You can so much can be learned on the job. So if you can get an apprenticeship or follow, you know, plumbers do that, electricians do that. If you can follow a guy around that can teach you about mechanicing or I don't know, whatever. I mean, I think you can learn better sometimes on in the process of like actually doing the job versus paying all this money for a school that's gonna teach you what? I mean, nothing. And they're gonna probably brainwash you with some crazy stuff, but that's a different podcast. So, well, so typically yeah, what I found with most of the technology in the schools are a couple of years outdated. So you're already behind the times when you start in it. And then when you get a job in that field, they want you to do an apprenticeship anyway to get up to speed. So now you're in debt even deeper because you paid for school and you're doing the apprenticeship at a lower rate. Mm -hmm. So if you can find a company that's willing to invest in you right off the bat and train you on the job, that's the best training you'll ever get. I agree. And I think it's a great way to do kind of a, I don't think you should go in with the mindset of like, I'm going to try this, but like, I do think it's a great way to learn. Like, do I really like this? Is this what I want to do? Cause you, Michael, you have your whole life ahead of you. And I, I can understand you have no idea what you want to do. And so it's like, to me to go to school, yeah, you get your generals done, but then you start like honing in and spending all this money on a, a craft. I know a guy who went to school for engineering. He's not an engineer today. He's a friggin' garage door installer. So I'm like, how does that work? I mean, you're going to go pay all that money. Like, just go on the job, start liking it. And if you don't like it, 
sorry, you have to quit the job and go to the next one. You don't have all this debt to pay for to learn what you like, right? Now, I'm not saying you can't go to college, but I think it's not for everybody. Well, on that note, too, there's, like, in the auto industry, they are starting to do, like, mentorship programs for young kids that are thinking about maybe being a mechanic. They'll pair them up with a seasoned... You can go to a dealership and or repair shop, and they'll bring you in, let you work for two, three, five, six months, however you want, long you want to set it up for, and see if you actually like that career. Yeah. And then you can go, you know, but you got to, they're most, they're doing it for like the seniors in high school that are just getting ready to graduate. And so you have that knowledge there. You can say, well, I've done this. I don't, this is not really for me. So they don't get buried deep in debt and to get into the field and don't like it. And then they have, they're stuck with that debt. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, with the kids in school right now, they each have kind of done job shadowing. And so they do allow that these days? Yeah, and I think it's really a good thing. I think they need more than just a day, though. Yep. I think, you know, maybe like a week time frame, um, you know, and I think it should be incorporated into the high school setting because, mm-hmm. you know, by 10th grade, they're already going, well, you're going to college. You know, where are you going to college? Yeah, they push you know, it. They've been asking, you know, everybody asked me, well, are your kids planning on going to college? Are they doing this? Are they doing that? And I think just having, you know, going in and following somebody that can actually show you what the job is. You know, obviously there's some jobs that you can't do, you know, like a firefighter. You can't go into a burning building with a firefighter and, you know, like that type of a thing. But obviously, you know, having somebody that would be able to be with them and say, hey, this is what we actually do. And like showing them what you're doing and that kind of stuff, you know, like, like you said, like the plumbing, the um electricians and you know even in a restaurant setting there's stuff that you can have a job shadow with that they just stand there and they kind of go oh I actually kind of like this or no this is not for me at all yeah I think anyone that's listening if you're on a school board we should be fixing these problems like why are we wasting we I was talking about this in Glenn when I went home I said we're wasting an hour a day in PE to learn to run and kick a ball I mean like let's get real life skill especially when they're older like, let's get a career advancement. Let's get a career exploration. Let's do something to start teaching them and get them in the field so they can learn what they want to do someday. But you know what? PE is very important. It is very important. I'm not going to tell Anne I said that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying, like, I honestly think that the lunch hour that kids can go outside as well, it burns off some energy and it gets their mind focused again, you know? And yeah. PE is that same thing. Like, they need it. And no offense to these parents that put their kids in front of the TVs, but you know, we, but we don't care if we offend you. Stop listening. We, we, uh, we kind of all have those moments of, okay, here's our babysitter. Let's go, you know, yeah. but at the same time, it's like, wow, I don't want my kids being in front of the TV all the time either. Well, I feel the same way. I understand choir. If you're going to like be something exciting and sing, or if you're going to be a jazz player or something, learn the instrument. But for the most part in high school, that's, it's, it's just a waste of it. You know how many hours we could gain for these kids to be learning real life skills that they're going to need on the ground so they can leave school and actually start to explore what they want to do with themselves and how they're going to proceed with their future, right? Instead of paying all this money in this college to just start learning all this crap that they're not going to use when you could get real life experience in high school. I mean, I would have loved that. Would you be interested in that, Michael? If that uh, was the thing, I mean, more than just what she's talking about. Uh, yeah, I would like to spend more time like learning more real life stuff and figure out what I want to do. Yeah. Like uh, I've listened to investors. Uh, Grant Cardone talks about we should be teaching kids about investing and buying real estate and what that looks like and how we can start to prosper them right off the bat. Because, you know, we don't le- I went to do an IRA at like 20 years old and the stupid banker never showed up. And so I didn't know what was going on. So I just like forget it, not doing it. And so I didn't do it for another 15 years. Do you know how much? compounding interest I could have had on that if I would have started investing in that and so I just think we need to put more real life skills in school real practical things that people can use the mentorship we're almost done um help me watch time Amelia uh on the mentorship side actually that led me right into my question has any of you or maybe even you in school I don't know what they do have you guys have any mentorship in your mentors in your career that like really stood out to you I have one if you need a second I can start my story real fast what you guys think so I had a boss, Margaret. She, When I lived in Wyoming, I had no family there. She kind of became like a second mom to me because she had a business. She was the first real female entrepreneur that I was inspired by because I had another one. She was a total jerk, and I couldn't stand her. But she taught me, like, work hard. You can do it. It's a, 
you know, and I'm not against men. Men are freaking strong and we need to ri- keep them going. Like we don't need to be tearing them down like the world does today. But you know, women, I'm not so much like women hear me roar, but like we can do a lot. And especially like me, I don't have kids. So I have to, I want to provide for my family. I want to provide a good retirement for my husband and me someday. And so to me, it's like, she taught me to be honest, do it the right way and be passionate about what you're doing. Cause if you, you can start a business, if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to stick to it and you're going to hate it every single day. And your people are going to hate it cause you don't even like your business. So it was really good for me. She dug into me a lot on like, it doesn't matter that you didn't go to college, right? Like for a degree, it doesn't matter that you come from poorness. Like you don't have to have mommy and daddy give you everything. You can all work hard. And I feel like all of us here have, and Michael, you're coming into this, but I'm proud of all you guys. You guys have worked so hard and you've built great families. And like you said, it's not all about money. It's not about things. You have wonderful children. You know, we, you've rolled through the storms of life and here we still are. And, and I think that's what it's about to me. And so she poured that into me. Do you guys have anyone? I'd probably have to say it was my, 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 the one I looked up to the most was my one boss that I had. He was a business owner, small business owner. Uh Uh-huh started the business out of his garage wow. and grew it to a over a million dollar a year business. Mm-hmm. And, and he was passing that knowledge on and then he got, you know, got age caught up and life happened and he passed on and they closed the business. And yeah, but it, I learned a lot there from, from him and kind of made me want to do the same thing. And it reminds you that like everyday people do it. I mean, small business is I think 80% of the economy is small business. It's not all Apple and Microsoft, right? Yeah. They, they're they huge employers, but we make up the economy, small business. And so I think just remembering that even you, Michael, uh, you don't have to, you don't have to go to college. You don't have to have rich parents, right? You don't have to have things given to you. If you just have the right heart and the right people pouring into you and you have people that believe in you and you believe in yourself, you can do anything. And I mean that literally, like you can do anything. And I'm not just talking about being an astronaut, like, you can own a business. You can have the family. And I think I'm curious on a mom's perspective because they say you can't have it all. How do you feel about that? It's all about time management. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, for the business that I, you know, I've always managed my schedule around the kids. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, if there's something going on, I make sure I take that day off. Um, you know, now obviously all of my stuff is seven days a week, so yeah. I'm, I can pick and choose, you know, oh yes, I'm going to work on this Sunday or oh, nope, I'm not working that Sunday or I need to work in the morning on that Sunday. So we have something in the evening going on. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I learned to do is time management, huge. Um, and there's some people that can't do it like, and then, and it's nothing against them. You know, they're great people in other aspects, mm-hmm. but time management is a huge thing. And I have how many calendars around the house, Mike? I six. Mean, like, six yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I want to hear really fast and then we'll go back to our mentorship. So don't let me forget that was my question for these two. But how do you manage that? Because I literally just heard someone else talk about this on their podcast. Like, how are you managing all of it with time? Um, I stay in contact with the kids all the time. Like, I'm always asking them, hey, where are you at? Hey, what's going on? You know, like Michael is pretty straightforward with what his schedule is, you know, but then his sister is all over the board and then his brother you know, he doesn't always respond back. So I really have to keep on top of him, but you know, it's, it's a constant like, Hey, where's this, what's going on? Where's, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And then I write my schedule on the board so they know where I'm at. And so do you have multiple schedules for each Mm -hmm. kid or how does it work? Well, I keep track of them. They keep track of themselves. And then, um, I put my schedule up on the board so they know where I'm at. And then if they can't find somebody, they'll either call me or call them because they all have cell phones. Mm -hmm. So you know, they kind of get a hold of each other, but they're all in school together. So they all know where they're at for the most part. It's yeah. just like, you know, if she has early morning practice, they have to get themselves, you know, the boys get themselves up by themselves or, you know, if I'm working late or I'm working later and it's not nice outside, they'll give me a call and be like, are you on your way? Like, are you stuck somewhere or what's going on? And, you know, like that kind of stuff. But how does the dad play into that? Cause men typically are not organized. Is it a disaster? Typically. <laughs> <laughs> no, he does very well. Uh, she does a better time of the I'm of just that curious. aspect of it the just, family aspect of keeping it, the schedules rolling and Yeah. It just it takes a second to kinda like really get into it and make mm-hmm. sure it's done. And once you have like a plan set up that works for you, because it doesn't always the same thing isn't gonna work for everybody. But you know, that's why I have like six different schedules. I have a small schedule book that's just for work. I and I write all my work stuff in it. I have a huge schedule book that incorporates everybody's stuff into it. I have the kids' stuff on a separate thing. And then I have, you know, I have stuff all over saying, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm doing, you know. So it just, 
just keeping track of everything is the, probably the hardest part of it all. So you just gave me an idea because I have multiple businesses. I'm coaching. I'm doing bookkeeping for multiple clients. I'm trying to figure it all out and I'm starting a new business. And I'm like, I don't, I tried one calendar and there's so much crap on it. I was, I can't do it. I don't really love digital. I need it quickly on my phone, but I'm, I like written. So that's a good idea. Maybe I need to break it into different calendars. Like this company's doing this, this company, you know, cause I yeah. hate making it complicated, but it's too much on one. Cause it's very confusing. Yeah, because when you have different things going on, you know, like like Elizabeth alone, if I put everything that's on her calendar on my stuff, my calendar would be full all yeah. the time. So, yeah. like, I just pick and choose the different things. You know, like, she's an FFA. I don't have to know everything about her FFA schedule. Like, yes, it's nice to know that on this certain Friday that she has a meeting and that she won't be home to make sure that the boys are up and at school. But then at the same time, you know, if she's at dance practice or something, you know, I don't have to write that on the schedule because I kind of know it in the back of my mind. But then, you know, something big like Michael has a dentist appointment on this day. If I'm not remembering that and he's not remembering that, like who's going to remember it? Do so. you check your calendar every week? Are you good about that? Like you obviously it sounds like you're working with her here, but your schedule is not crazy. But um, the biggest thing is normally she doesn't tell me until like two days before. So then I'm like, wait, what? Yes, I do forget. So. <laughs> and what about you, Nate? How does how do you play in all that? I mean, do you just kind of rely on Amelia to figure it all out and she bosses you around? <laughs> Sometimes. Um, but that's part of the marriage thing. Yeah, it is, absolutely. Typically that the she's she's a she's very good at that organizational side. I usually uh just kinda yep, it's this time to do it, let's go do it. Or more of, I fly by more of the seat of the pants in that aspect. If I'll try to do one thing right up to the minute where I absolutely have to walk away from it. That's why I think marriages work so well, because I think you do kind of marry your opposite. I mean, you have things in common, but you don't, right? So John is more, he, he, he wants to run by the seat of his pants, and I'm very organized. And I will say your marriage is in good shape because John today told me he needed a safe room thing via my nephew. So <laughs> if anyone has a safe space for my husband to come, there's a big ass massage chair that he'll bring with him and you can continue on with that. Okay. So good job to you two on that. Um, do you, okay. Mentorship. I have to get back cause we're almost out of time. Do you have any comments on that? I would say all my mentors are the people that I've actually taken care of, you know, because listening to them and listening to what they want and what they don't want is huge. Um, you know, like you, even bosses can do this too. Like, I don't want somebody that's going to be like this and you can be like, okay, cool. But at the same time, bosses need to be challenged once in a while too, you know? And, but they have to take that into consideration of like, is somebody doing it to be a bully or are they doing it to be like actually improve things? Yeah. You know, cause everybody has a different perspective, but a lot of the people that are been my mentors is pretty much anybody that I've been taking care of because then they give me an idea of like, I can do better on this. Yeah, and I think, uh, and I'm coming to you, Michael, so think about that. But I think on what you just said there is really good because, one, the people that are in, I don't mean to make this sound like condescending, but the people that are working with the people, they're not going to come to the boss and say what's going on. They're going to tell their coworkers or their boss, and, and then it's their job to get it to the boss because I don't always know what the heartbeat on the ground is, right? And then I want to adjust because sometimes they have such a perspective of, like, I always say John's in charge of the back and I, you know, I'll implement, but I need to hear from them. Like, what is wrong? What's going on? Do you not have the, we, we have meetings where we ask what equipment are we missing? What can we do to make your job better? Because I don't understand always, and I don't understand fully production. So I need to know like, what is the backlog there? Who's causing issues? What's happening? And so I think, yeah, being very receptive as the boss, remembering you don't know everything and you can very much learn and respect your people. And they're going to appreciate you because they're going to feel like they invested knowing that they, got everybody else a better system or I don't know, a vending machine that works or whatever. So I think it's good to have them kind of invest in it. Okay. I want to hear from you. Mentorship. Do you have anybody? Um, I'd say you can say me. I mean, that's okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I'd say some of my biggest mentors has got to be my parents, obviously. Aww. And then definitely not John. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's the one looking yeah. for a safe space. Yeah. Um, and like, uh, some of my teachers just because they like, um, fully incorporate as much as they can that they're uh, able to into like what you're doing and what you're trying to pursue and then they also like tell you hey that's not the greatest idea but they don't just say hey that's a terrible idea they'll go like hey that's a bad idea but this might help you like and that's a good foundation and like work on that in a different aspect yeah 
Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. Anyone, we didn't get through most of my questions, but we had such a great conversation and I truly learned a bunch from you guys. I love, I wish you guys were here. We'd have this more often. I promise you next time they're out here, I'm going to get them back on because they were fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, any last minute thoughts from anyone? I'm just thinking, you know, as a boss standpoint, if you're a business owner or a boss or slash whatever, um, listen to your employees. If they have ideas, don't just discredit them because you've already thought about it or that it's been brought up once more because then they'll quit altogether offering ideas altogether and then they'll start resenting the company or you as a boss or a person in charge and it'll just it'll it'll start get going negative versus positive so you're telling me my suggestion box being the trash can is not a great idea not a good one okay I'll, I'll change that next time. <laughs> My workers are going to be so happy. <laughs> okay, Amelia, do you have any last minute thoughts? Just make it fun to work because, you know, the more fun you have at work, the more likely they're going to be there. Um, I, and Michael can attest to this, I get a little crazy when I'm at work and be a little goofy and things like that. But, um, you know, I like to have fun and like work is work, but at the same time, you got to enjoy it to some extent because if you don't, again, the resentment comes into play and it's not then it's not fun for anybody. And you literally spend more time with your coworkers and your own family. So think about that. I mean, you don't want to be a douche at work because it's not going to be fun and your people are going to quit. And if you own it, you're in big trouble. So great. Michael, what do you got for us? Give us something really great to end on. Um, I'd say don't like, just because you guys spend like this, you guys say that you spend like more time with your coworkers than your family. Like um, I've been at a couple companies where they say, hey, we're a family. We should act like a family. But then at the same time, but it's like we don't really have like the special connection that my family has with me. And then it's like you're trying to force me to like like act like we're all goody goody and family and everything. But then we're really not, you know. So really show what what's the word for that? Um, Mean what you say, say what you mean. There we go. We're going to end on that. So thank you all for listening. Again, I want to thank Michael, Amelia, and Nathan for coming on. You guys, I love you guys very much. I'm so excited you came to visit me. We're going to do this again. If anyone has any questions, comments, feedback, uh, it's lightupyourbusinessllc at gmail.com. Like, subscribe, and share this podcast. We'll see you guys next time. And remember, in the world of business, every success story begins with a passionate dream and ends with a strategic billion-dollar handshake. Stay ambitious, stay innovative, and keep making those deals that reshape tomorrow. Thank you all for tuning in, and until next time, remember Proverbs 3.3 says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. That way, you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. And remember, if you like what you heard today, click the follow button so you never miss an episode.